This is flip mini lecture number 19, and it's on the beginning of chapter 9. And if you look at nine, night, chapter 9, section 9.1 is kind of this fluffy overview. And I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview, but I don't want to spend too much time on overview. I want to go deep into 9.2. Let me just give you just a little overview. In physics, an awful lot of words are precise versions of words that we use in everyday life, like acceleration and deceleration, or velocity and speed, um, or length and magnitude. Those are all words that we have tightened up the definition of. In the case of these things that I'm about to introduce, which are called work and energy, The physics definitions of these words are really a lot tighter and more specific than the everyday definition. So the everyday definition of work might be that, uh, I don't know, I go to work from nine to five maybe. And energy is a term that's thrown around by all sorts of people. Like one person might say, that person has good energy. In physics, these two terms are going to have a really precise definition. Now, unfortunately, these definitions don't quite get along with your uh, everyday intuition. So here's something. I'm holding up a book. If I have to hold this book here for long enough, I'm going to start getting tired in this arm. I mean, sure, if for a minute or so, you're not going to notice it at all, but if you did it for 15 minutes, you would probably get to the point where you can't hold your arm at that angle anymore. So we have this idea that just holding something up involves work, and that comes from our, our biological um, experience of doing work. Now the thing is, you aren't really doing any work from the physics standpoint there. And in fact, if I had um, a shelf here, where I was holding that book up. If I had a shelf here instead, I could just set the book on the shelf and the book would stay there until I took the book off the shelf. And the shelf isn't doing any work. Clearly, the shelf isn't doing any work. It's not going to get tired. It's not going to need uh, a burrito after a while so that it can keep up the hard work. So this feeling that we are getting from biology that holding something up, just holding it still, is work is a mistaken impression from just how our muscles are constructed. That's about all I want to say in kind of a, a loose general way. Let's get into 9.2. And Knight has a way of driving a whole bunch of formulas in 9.2 and I could certainly just repeat Knight's way. Let me do it my own way. So I am going to make a definition of something that I'm going to call K. Let me not even worry for a moment here what K stands for. I'm going to make a definition that the K of a particle is 1 half M times V squared, where that's its speed squared. Already there's a little bit here to unpack. That's its speed squared, but that symbol also might mean this. V is equal to the length of V, so this might, you could interpret this as being the length of the velocity vector squared. So another way of writing k is 1 half m times v squared. Now, quite a long time ago in this class, I showed you that if you have a vector and you're trying to calculate its length, well, in two dimensions, if you're trying to calculate its length and it has one side that's vx and another side that's vy, and you're trying to calculate the length of that side, you just use the Pythagorean theorem, and that you get in the two dimensions that v is equal to the square root of vx squared plus vy squared. But you might remember that I actually generalized this to three dimensions and we discovered that the length of the vector v is equal to vx squared plus vy squared plus vz squared square root. So in three dimensions there's the formula for the length of a vector in terms of its components. So this thing up here then, since it has v squared in it, and this is an expression that has the square root, but the squared is going to cancel the square root, this thing up here simplifies. 
So this thing that I'm calling K looks like that. Now here's an interesting thing. We can ask, what's the time derivative of this thing? So let's try it. Let's just see what we get. D by dt of k. Well, d by dt of k is d by dt of this thing on the right hand side. So that's 1 half m times d by dt of something squared. Well, d by dt of something squared is twice that thing. Chain rule says you get twice the thing to the first power times the derivative of the thing itself. So taking d by dt of k, this first term here gives me 2vx dvx dt. Taking d by dt of the second term, I have 2vy dvy dt. And the third term, I have plus 2vz dbz dt. Well, that's nice. All these halves and twos cancel. And I'm left with mvx dvx dt plus mvy dvy dt plus mvz dvz dt. But dvx dt, we have a name for that, we call that ax. And dvy dt, we have a name for that, we call that ay. And dvz dt, we have a name for that, we call that az. So I can write all this as, this is equal to Vx times Max plus Vy times May plus Vz times Maz. Well, why did I put the Ms there? Well, because Max, that's Fx by Newton's second law. And May, that's Fy by Newton's second law. And Maz, that's Fz by Newton's second law. So I've just learned that I have a nice clean way of writing the time derivative of k with respect to t. I'm gonna put that back all the way up at the top. d by dt of k is equal to vx fx plus vy fy plus Bz, Fz. Now, the next thing I want to do to this thing. This is the time derivative of k. If that's the time derivative of k and I wait a little time delta t, that's this time rate of change. This time rate of change times the amount of time that's elapsed, that's how much it's changed. So this, if I multiply both sides of this equation by delta t everywhere, I have a new interpretation. I have the change in k in a little time delta t is delta t times dk dt. And then over here on the right hand side, what can I do to clean this up? Well, delta t times vx, that's how far the particle has moved in the x direction in a time delta t. So that's equal to, this thing right here is equal to delta x. And we still have this fx going for the ride. Delta t times vy, that's delta y. And we have the Fy going along for the ride. And delta T times Vz, that's delta Z. And we have the Fz going along for the ride. We now know that if you take the force vector, which is Fx comma Fy comma Fz, and you take the displacement vector, which is delta X, delta Y, and delta z, and you take fx delta x plus fy delta y plus fz delta z, you get the change in this thing that I'm calling k. Well, just let me introduce some no more notation. If I have any two vectors, a and b, okay, it doesn't matter what they are, if I have any two vectors, a and b, and a is equal to ax comma ay comma az, 
and b is equal to bx comma by comma bz, then I can define a new thing which I call a dot b, also known as a inner product b. And it's this is the definition of a inner product b. A inner product b is equal to ax bx plus ay by plus az bz. Okay, that's the definition of the dot product. Well, this is fx delta x plus fy delta y plus fz delta z, which is the dot product of f and delta r, according to this new thing. So this entire thing here is actually equal to delta r dot f. And we have just shown that you take the force you take its dot product with delta r, the displacement, and you get the change in this thing that I called k. Okay. Only one last thing left to tell you, which is we're going to give some actual names to these things. This thing here, delta r dot f, that's called the amount of work done, or the delta w, or just w. That's the work done. Delta K is the change in, and I'm giving it a name now, K was actually short for kinetic energy. So now we can say it. The change in the kinetic energy in English. The change in the kinetic energy is equal to work. And we wanted to say it in a little bit more detail. This is the force on the particle, and this thing that we've defined here is the work done on the particle. So the change in the kinetic energy is equal to the work done on the particle. Why are we being so, so specific about that? Well, because if the part of something is pushing on the particle, then the particle is also pushing back on whatever's pushing on it, thanks to Newton's third law. And we're trying to be clear here about whose energy is changing. It's the particle's energy. And who's doing the work? It's this external force that's acting on this particle. And then later on when we get to systems with multiple particles, each of them can be doing work on each other. But for now, we have an external force that's applied to this particle as it moves through some displacement delta r, and we've just discovered, just using chain rule and Newton's second law, we've just discovered that k, which is defined to be 1 half mv squared, changes like this.